In this video, we're going to look at two examples of Stokes' theorem. One, using Stokes' theorem to calculate the value of a line integral by calculating the surface integral, and one vice versa. So let's just recall like a little bit about what Stokes' theorem says without all of the details. I've got a video previously on the channel where I have all of the details written down, and we even prove a special case of it. So if S is some sort of nice surface, it's got to be piecewise smooth and it has a boundary curve C, and then there's something having to do with the orientation of the surface and the orientation of the boundary curve. So I'll point that out when we get to this, but it's also like, like I said in those previous videos, and then F is a vector field with continuous first partials, and that has to be on a set that contains S. Then we have um, the conclusion, which says that the surface integral over S of the curl of F dot dS, so that's a vector surface integral, is equal to the line integral over the vector field F. So the first example we want to look at is this one. So I've written this line integral over a vector field, but I've written it in a slightly different way. This is a different notation for that line integral over a vector field. And then our curve is this thing parameterized by cosine t sine t sine t, where t is from 0 to 2 pi. So one thing that's really nice about that is that it's actually an ellipse. It has a pretty cool shape. Okay, well, the first thing I want to do is notice that this is equal to the line in the integral of the vector field, f dot dr, where f is made up uh, of these three functions. In other words, the component functions of f are those. And again, that's just the different notation for writing down um, line integrals of vector fields. So this is 2xy squared z comma 2x squared y z comma x squared y squared minus 2z. Great. Maybe one thing to notice, if we let this be the x, y, and z component, we actually have um, x squared plus one half y squared plus z squared equals one. Because notice we've got two copies of sine there. So that, together with this parameterization, you can kind of infer that this is an ellipse. And so this is in fact an ellipse, and notice that it's embedded inside the plane y equals zero, z, because notice also that the y component here is equal to the z component here. So now let's do a sketch up of this curve. So, like I said, it's going to be an ellipse, and it's an ellipse that lies within the plane y equals z, and again, we can see that because we have the y and the z component are the same. So I'm going to go ahead and draw this kind of tilty ellipse like this, and just think about that being in the plane y equals z. Okay. Now, we have a lot of choices here because by Stokes' theorem, all that we need is that the boundary of S equals the curve C. Well, there's infinitely many surfaces that have boundary C, so we might as well choose the simplest one, and that simplest one will be just the plane Y equals Z. Like we said before, this ellipse lives inside that plane y equals z, so we might as well take that as our surface. So let's go ahead and maybe shade that in like this. So this is what we'll call our surface, which like I said is the plane y equals z. But if it's the plane y equals z, well then that means we can just use a nice uh, rectangular parameterization for this plane. So what I'll do in order to find my region in the xy plane that helps us parameterize that, I'll just look at the shadow. So I'll drop this thing down. But notice if we drop this thing down, in other words, project it down, that's just like setting the z component equal to zero, which gives us cosine and sine, but um, those obviously parameterize a circle. So the outside of this is a circle, great, making the inside of this just this disk. Okay, fantastic. What that means is that we can parameterize our surface with the following equation. So I'll use S, X, Y. So notice the X component is just X because we can use our parameters to be X and Y given that we have Z a function of X and Y, kind of trivially a function of X. And then we have Y here and Y here. Okay, so how do we want to think about this? We go to a point X, Y on the X, Y plane 
recall that this is the xy plane, and then we go up to this point y on the z axis. So any point on this plane will be of the form x comma y comma y. Great. So that definitely parametrizes it. And then I should say that um, here x and y need to be from this set um, that's made up of everything inside of that disk. So I'll just write that like this. And this is generally what we call D um, when we use the notation that we used before. Okay, so now let's go ahead and maybe call this thing I and then apply Stokes' theorem. So to apply Stokes' theorem to I, that's going to give us the surface integral over S of the curl of F so I like to write that as del cross f. That's probably because I studied physics in my background. It, it seems like mathematicians mostly like to write C-U-R-L, but um, I like this del cross f thing. And then dot ds, good. But then um, using the definition of the surface integral over a vector field, that's going to be the integral over d, which is that region right there. And then we have the curl of f dotted with um, dotted with the partial of s with respect to x cross the partial of s with respect to y. And then again, that's just like, and again, that's just, and again, that's just from the construction that we had for surface integrals over vector fields. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and clean up the board and we're gonna pick up at this point and finish it off. So just to pick up where we left off, our goal integral is now equal to this, which is really just a double integral at this point. So we use Stokes' theorem to turn this into a surface integral over a vector field. Then we use the definition of a surface area over a vector field to turn it into just a plain old double integral. It's got a fancy form, but that's really just a plain double integral. Now let's go ahead and calculate this curl of f and then this guy right here as well. And then we'll input those into um, our formula. So let's do curl of f first. So we'll use the matrix version of this. So we'll have uh, the ith, j, and the kth component here. Now we need the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y, and the partial with respect to z. We'll put the first component right here, then the second component right here. So that's 2x squared y z, and then the third component right here. So that's x squared y squared minus 2z. Great. So we get something like that. Now, I'm not going to work out all the details, but we'll do cofactor expansion. That is our first entry of this curl will be made up of the determinant of that 2 by 2. Um, and then the second entry will be the determinant of the 2 by 2 by crossing that out, and so on and so forth. So we've got a bunch of videos on the channel where we did the curl really, really explicitly, especially when we defined it for the first time. So I'll just go ahead and point, that this, it, point out that this is going to be equal to um, x squared comma 0. So that's what you get for that curl. Okay, fantastic. Now let's go ahead and take this cross product. So let's do that down here. So we need SX cross SY. So that's going to be, um, again, we'll use our determinant version of the cross product. So I'll put my X derivative of my surface parameterization right here. Oh, and I just realized that is no longer on the board. So let's just recall that this is equal to X comma Y comma Y. Okay. So here we have 1, 0, 0, and now here we have 0, 1, 1. So that's a pretty easy thing to calculate, and we'll see that um, this is equal to the vector 0, negative 1, 1. Okay, fantastic. Now what I'm going to do is take this quantity for the curl and this quantity for Sx cross Sy, and I'll put them right here. Okay, so I entered those things into our formula. Now we can just go ahead and take that dot product. Notice we've got a really nice structure here because this guy right here, which is zero, is going to dot into this, which cancels it. And then furthermore, this guy right here, which is zero, is going to dot into that, which cancels that. So all we really need to do is multiply this term into this negative one. 
So that's going to be the double integral over d of 2xy uh, minus 2xy squared dA. But if we look at this, this is just screaming us for us to use polar coordinates, and we can, and this is gonna be polar coordinates on the polar rectangle given by zero one cross zero to two pi. Where as is standard, x is equal to r cos theta and y is equal to r sine theta. So, uh, okay, so now we transform this double integral with these two substitutions and this is our new, um, and this is, and these are our new bounds of integration. We'll recall that dA becomes r dr d theta when we do this change of variables. So that will give us the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 1. Now we have 2 r cubed cos theta sine theta minus 2 r to the fourth cos theta sine squared theta, dr d theta. Okay, great. So one thing that I want to point out here is um, here I have an x times y, which will give me r squared, but I added my other r in because of the dA component. Now the next thing that I want to do is notice I can factor a cosine out of everything in the integrand. Actually, I can factor a bunch of stuff out. I can factor a 2r cubed out and a cosine out. So let's do that. So we factor 2r cubed out of the right, and we're left with sine theta here minus r sine squared theta here. And then we've got cosine theta d theta dr. And like I, and like I alluded to, I want to change my order of integration. So I'll do that. Okay, fantastic. But now we can do a little bit of u substitution. Let's go ahead here and let u equal sine theta. That's gonna make du equal to cosine theta d theta. But when theta equals zero, u is zero. And when theta equals two pi, u is also zero. But what that tells us is that this theta integral is just going to give us zero, meaning the whole thing is equal to zero. Okay, great, so that finishes this example. I'll clean up the board and then we'll do one more example. For our next example, we wanna work in the opposite direction. That is, we want to calculate the surface integral by calculating a line integral and applying Stokes' theorem. So we want to find the surface integral of the curl of f dot ds, where s is part of this paraboloid that is above the plane z equals zero. In other words, it is above the xy plane. And I forgot to write down what our f is in this case. So in this case, our f is x comma y squared comma z e to the xy. Okay, so let's go ahead and get a picture going here. So like I said, this is a paraboloid. Another thing to notice, if we set z equal to zero, we'll get an ellipse. So that's actually gonna be extremely important. So we've got this uh, downward facing paraboloid that intersects this plane in, a, in an ellipse. And let's just point out that the equation of this ellipse is x squared plus two y squared equals one. We don't wanna calculate the surface integral, we want to calculate the line integral instead, which means we need to parametrize this ellipse. But we can take inspiration from polar coordinates just scaled a little bit and make it not so bad. So we'll take r of t to be equal to cosine t. Notice when we do cosine squared, which would be x squared, we're looking for a companion which will give us y squared, which means we wanna think like sine of t, which would give us sine squared. Cosine squared plus sine squared is one, but notice that's gonna give us two sine squared, so we'll put a one over the square root of two here. And now notice, if we set this guy equal to x, this guy equal to y, then those satisfy the defining equations of this ellipse. And I should point out here that this is parametrized in three dimensions, but we're sitting down here in the z equals zero plane. Okay, fantastic. Now the next thing that I wanna do 
is uh, apply Stokes' theorem to rewrite this as the line integral over C of f dot dr. But that is going to be um, the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And that's because I'll need all angles in order to draw this whole thing. And now I have f, but I'm going to compose f with my curve. So that's going to give me uh, cosine t here, 1 half sine t here, and then 0 in that component. And now I need to dot that with r prime. So I'll go ahead and dot that with r prime, which is minus sine of t, uh, 1 over root 2, cosine t, comma 0, and then I do dt. Okay, so to reiterate, this is f evaluated at r dot r prime dt, which is our strategy for finding line integrals of vector fields. Now we can go ahead and do that dot product. That's going to give us the integral from 0 to 2 pi of minus sine t cos t plus 1 over 2 times the square root of 2 uh, sine t cos t. And I just realized this should have been sine squared t, which makes this sine squared t dt, like that. But this actually looks a lot like the integral we just calculated in the other example. So let's go through this quickly. We can, count, we can factor a cosine out of the right. That's going to give us the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 over 2 root 2 sine squared t minus sine t. I'm reordering that as well so I don't have a hanging minus sign up front. Now I can go ahead and do a u substitution. So let's uh, let u equal sine of t. That makes du equal to cos t dt. That's going to change my integral to the integral of 1 over 2 root 2 uh, u squared minus u du. But now when so when but now when t is 0, sine is 0, so u is 0. And when t is 2 pi, sine is 0, so u is 0. So we get the integral from 0 to 0. So we get 0 again. Okay, that's a good place to stop.